this episode, we delve into five documentary series, The Jinx, Black Twitter, Telemarketers, Our Planet, and Beckham, live from Los Angeles. I'm Tom Powers, and this is Pure Nonfiction. Last Sunday, our podcast partnered with The Ankler, an entertainment newsletter, to host an afternoon of conversations with filmmakers who are eligible for Emmy nominations. We sat down in front of 250 people at Neuhaus on Sunset Boulevard. If you'd like to attend one of our future events, make sure you sign up for our newsletter. Over the next two episodes, we'll bring you highlights of the day. In this installment, we look at five recent documentary series. Whether or not you've seen the work, my goal in these interviews is to give you an essence of where the filmmakers are coming from. We started the day with Andrew Jarecki, whose new project is The Jinx Part Two. Andrew began his career with capturing The Freedmen's, one of the most critically acclaimed documentaries of the century. He followed it directing a fiction film called All Good Things, starring Ryan Gosling, inspired by the true story of the real estate mogul Robert Durst, who was suspected of murdering his wife Kathy in 1982. When All Good Things was coming to theaters, Andrew got a call from the real Robert Durst, who expressed interest to tell his side of the story. Out of that came the landmark series The Jinx that premiered on HBO in 2015. The Jinx explored three different murders that had Durst as a suspect. As the six episodes rolled out each week, viewers became more convinced of his guilt. Just before the last episode aired, he went on the run and was arrested in New Orleans at the behest of a Los Angeles prosecutor. They had reopened the murder case of Susan Berman, a good friend of Durst who got on his bad side. This spring, Andrew released The Jinx Part Two, that covers Susan Berman's murder trial. The series also looks at the characters who surrounded and enabled Durst. Andrew had access to extensive recordings of Durst in prison, talking to his confidants on the phone. In the trailer, we hear him giving instructions to a friend. You should expect to get a call from the DA wanting to talk to you, but you don't tell them shit. And here's the Los Angeles prosecutor, John Lewin. Turns out, when you have a whole lot of money, people are willing to do things for you because they think some of that money might go their way. Andrew had already spent several years making a fiction film and a documentary series about Durst, I asked what made him want to make another. A failure of imagination. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I think that we didn't have any um, anticipation that we would make another part of the Jinx. There was never a plan for a part two. But uh, my partner Zach and I were watching the uh, preliminary witnesses. So in, in L.A., you are allowed, if you're doing a murder trial, to bring in what they call preliminary or conditional witnesses. And those are people who might um, either die because of old age and therefore their testimony would not be preserved, or somebody who's at risk maybe of being harmed because they're a witness. And so in the LA murder trial of Bob Durst, there were lots of those witnesses and the judge had allowed them to interview them. And so, um, I was fascinated by these people because when we were making part one of the jinx, we would always say, how do you kill three people over 30 years and get away with it? It takes a village. Let's, let's look at the people who were around Bob Durst and uh, who were ordinary decent people in their own minds and yet somehow got drawn into a um, murderous series of plots. And so these people were now testifying in Los Angeles, and Zach and I were watching little clips of video, and we would just be so surprised, and at some point, I think I texted him, and I said, you know, I can't stop watching this. Doesn't this make you want to watch, you know, doesn't this make you want to make more episodes? And he said, yes, and, and that's kind of how we got drawn into it. So I want to ask you about those figures who enabled Bob Durst uh, over the years. Let me use an example. There's a figure named uh, Nick uh, Chavin. His background, he was a porn lyric country star, is that what you would call him? Yeah. Yeah, you know when you listen to country music and there's the pornographic variety? That was his that was specialty. Nick's thing. And 
he befriended Bob Durst through Susan Berman, um, who Bob Durst later killed. Um, that's what the trial that we just saw uh, was about. But uh, Nick Chavin describes in your film that his two best friends were Bob Durst and Susan Berman. After Susan Berman's death, he remained loyal to, uh, to Bob. Um, and, you know, uh, for a long time refused the prosecutor's request to do an interview and, uh, and so forth. You interview Nick Chavin. You also interview his wife, who had a very different moral take on this whole thing. While, while her husband was kind of standing by Bob, she was, I think it's fair to say, horrified by uh, the situation. How does, how does he exemplify the people who were standing by Bob Durst? Well, in some ways, if, if, if anybody's seen the last episode of, the, of part two of The Jinx, you know, he goes to a very interesting place uh, where he becomes, in some ways, the only person who really takes responsibility for having been a part of Bob's world, not standing up, not saying anything, really. Um, and so Nick is both complicit and remorseful, and that is uh, different than a lot of people. Most of the people who are drawn into Bob's web um, end up in some way wretched, you know, that old expression. Um, you see them kind of hollowed out and destroyed by their own complicity. And I, I have a lot of compassion for those people. You know, it's easy to see these people and say, oh, that's ridiculous. You know, schadenfreude is very appealing. It's a fun emotion to see somebody falling apart and say, well, thank God that's not me. But I think the more interesting thing is to say, what was it about these people that made Bob believe that he could um, bring them in, that they would be vulnerable to him. And you find that they all have reasons. You know, uh, Susie Giordano, who is somebody who uh, always believed Bob was innocent, but then, you know, ended up maybe sending $115,000 in a suitcase to Bob by UPS when he was on the run. You know, she's a, she, in some ways, she feels like a ridiculous character, but I know her well now, and I know she's got like five kids. A couple of them are having, you know, emotional problems. She's got big money problems. And here's Bob, who's saying, well, listen, I didn't do any of these things. And it's very tempting to believe him when he's telling it to your face and saying, I absolutely didn't do these things, especially if you've got needs and he's willing to meet those needs. And by the time she gets on the witness stand to be a character witness for Bob in the trial that you saw in the clip, she's gotten about $450,000 worth of cash and benefits from Bob. And it galvanized a lot of the problems in her life. It allowed her to, to survive in some ways. So I, I find it you know, very satisfying when, when somebody watches it and instead of just saying, uh, those people are like these burlesque characters, but instead say, what would I have done? What would I have done if I didn't if I didn't know for sure that he killed these people and all I had to do was put this thing in a suitcase and he told me it was going to be okay and it's going to solve a lot of problems for me? You know, I, I feel that we have to look at these people and ask ourselves that question, um, more ask ourselves a question about ourselves. When was the last time you had any contact with Bob Durst? Well, after the um, arrest, so Bob is arrested the day before the final episode of The Jinx Part One, um, based on the material that's, that's coming in that sixth episode, because there was a lot of controversy at the time. People said, well, you know, did HBO coordinate with the police the arrest of Bob Durst? And that was totally ridiculous. Like, that's not how cops, they don't call up television networks and say, we got an idea. But it wasn't entirely crazy because it was the cause of the arrest. In the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office, they were saying, we don't yet feel confident that we've interviewed every last person. We know this guy is going to have a $20 million defense team. We've still got work to do. We don't want to arrest him. The LAPD was saying, we've seen episode six. Trust me, we're arresting him. 
we're not going to let him go to Cuba and then have that be on the front page of the LA Times that the LAPD was so ridiculous that we didn't do the work of arresting this guy when we knew that he was going to Cuba. So it, it was very clear that um, those two things did happen in a relationship. It just wasn't a conspiratorial um, you know, relationship. So, so it had to happen. I didn't answer your question no, entirely. I was asking you when you last spoke right, about so this. I, so I, you know, after that, I, um, I felt, uh, I guess, guilty. I felt sad that my relationship with Bob had ended that way, not because I didn't feel that it was justified. It was clear that Bob was a killer and potentially would kill somebody else if, if we hadn't helped the police. But it was, just feels weird as a filmmaker to be m mucking around in the law enforcement process. It was a very unusual situation to be in. And so I knew that Bob was in New Orleans. He had been um, arrested and brought to this place called the, um, the uh, St. Charles Parish Jail. And I took my daughter down to Jazz Fest and I thought, I'm probably gonna go try to visit Bob Durst. Uh, you know, I didn't have a camera. I, I, didn't, I didn't think, well, I'm gonna do an interview with him. So I went down to see him and uh, I put my daughter in the hotel room with a video or something and I said, I'll be back in a little while. <laughs> if I don't come back, call your mom. Um, but I, I got in a car and I went out there and, um, and I went in and the woman said, uh, he's out. And I said, they can go out. <laughs> this made me extremely uncomfortable since I knew he was also very angry at me. And uh, she said, well, he's at an appointment. So I thought, okay, he's at a medical appointment or something like that. I waited and a van came in the front entrance of the, of the jail and pulled into a little sally port and the gates closed. And I walked over there uh, and I did have my iPhone out and I was kind of filming and I saw the gates, the, the, the doors open, and out walks, shuffles Bob Durst, wearing leg irons, and he's a tiny little guy, and handcuffs, and I'm in the bright sunlight, and he's in the shade, and I say, Bob, it's Andrew, and he kind of looks at me quizzically, and then he just sort of shuffles inside, and I go back in, and I say to the lady, well, he's back, will you call him and ask him if he'll see me? And she says, she calls and she says, he declined the visit, and so I, I, I had that moment with him, but he didn't really want to talk to me. And then later, like everything in this show, there's a phone call between Bob and Deborah, his wife, and he says, you'll never guess who tried to visit me today. And were there, did you make follow-up attempts uh, after that? Or? I wrote him a letter that I never sent, and I worked on it for a long time, and the purpose of the letter was to say, this is your last chance probably at your sentencing to tell the McCormick family what happened to their daughter, what happened to their sister, who you killed. It's not really debate, debatable now. It's clear that you killed your beautiful wife. This is a chance for you to do something good in the world. And I know you want to do something good in the world. He had said that to me. You know, He said when I first started working on this, he said, well, I would like there to be something out there from me, something that's not just the tabloid saying who I am, but something that expresses who I see myself as, as a good person. So I, I feel he was very genuinely felt that he was a good person, had gotten into some bad situations and needed to do some things to survive. Um, so anyway, I wrote him this letter, hoping that at some point I would send it. And then I showed it to my whole team and they were like, you're not sending Bob Durst a letter. We're not inserting ourselves into his situation right now. Um, but I thought it was kind of his last chance to do something positive. So now that the full series, second series, is, uh, is out there, what have you heard back from, from people who are part of it? You know, uh, Terry Chavin, who's the 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 uh, the wife of Nick Chavin, who was Bob's kind well, of most- referring to before. Yeah. yeah. You know, she said to me, well, I haven't watched it. It's too painful for me to see it. I, I didn't like it when it was happening. I, I sat down with you and I did this interview. I'm glad I did. I know it was important. I, I was appreciative that you were able to get Bob locked up and it did give me some closure, but I can't watch it. 
but I'm hearing that Nick doesn't come off well. Her husband. Yeah. And I said, you know, I don't think that's true. If you look at the whole series, which probably will take you a year before you feel like you have some distance from it and you can do it, I think you'll see that it really does show Nick as he, as he was. He was very conflicted. He's the guy who says early in the interview, you know, Bob and I were a two-man brotherhood. I guess I just didn't have a problem, that moral problem, with murder and murderers. So this is a guy who had really bought into the idea that he and Bob were like punk rock, they were anarchists, and it was very cool. And then, Maybe you know, that's what she meant, that she, he didn't come off that well. But I did say to her, if you keep watching, he goes to a much better place. So we know that is Nick. That is fair for me to show Nick that way, but it is also fair for me to show his epiphany, his change of heart, and, and, and the catharsis that he goes through. Uh, as I wrap up this segment, I want to ask what this whole journey has meant for you personally. It's now been, uh, what, 15 years of some kind of involvement around Bob Durst from fiction to, through two documentary series. I want, to, I want that to be true, but it's actually 21 years. Um, and I started, um, after I made Capturing the Freedmans, I started working on um, a little mini documentary in a way about Bob Durst uh, because I thought we were gonna write a, a feature film about him and I just wanted to interview all the living people. And then I kind of got hooked, uh, especially on the story of this missing girl who was obviously a superb human being. I mean, she had really had a, had, had, you know, came from nothing and got herself into nursing school, then Albert Einstein Medical School. She was going to be a pediatrician. And I felt really connected to that, to that family. Um, and then I was just sort of in it. And we wrote the film between, um, uh, you know, I, I guess Capturing the Freedmans came out in 2003. We wrote it. We finished it. We filmed it. And in 2010, um, it was about to come out. And that's when, when Bob read an article saying, Ryan Gosling playing Bob Durst. And he was like, hmm, let me call this guy and see if I can watch the movie. And then that was sort of the first step. And then after that, we got into this world of making a documentary about him. I thought I was already done with Bob Durst a few times over. And that led to 2000, you know, that was between 2010 and around 2015 when the jinx comes out uh and here we are i don't know what is it 2016 eh, it's a couple just a couple years anyway and here we are 2024 and and all i would say is it's been the most interesting longitudinal story because it keeps changing and it and it's about so much about what's going on in the world you know a big part of part two is about complicity and complicity is what we're seeing in America right now. All these people that are saying, well, I really wasn't a part of the bad thing, but I'm thinking about doing it again. You know, it's just so, so to me, it's, it's always been fresh. It's never felt like, well, we're going back into the, that down that Bob Durst rabbit hole. It's always felt like it's, it's had a reason for being, and I made other films in the meantime, but this has definitely been a theme I did not expect to be on for this long, but I, I feel very lucky to have been able to do it. That was Andrew Jarecki talking about The Jinx Part 2. You can watch the series from HBO Documentary Films, streaming on Max. Our next interview explores the three-part series from Onyx Collective called Black Twitter, A People's History. It's an insightful look at how the black community turned Twitter into their own platform for sharing jokes, opinions, and advocacy. They launch cultural waves out of hashtags like Black Girl Magic and political movements such as Black Lives Matter. We hear from a wide range of Black Twitter users. Here's a clip from the trailer that starts with April Rain, who coined the term Oscars So White. We move the culture forward. We did it, Joe. I do know one thing is that when Black Twitter showed up, come on. It was at the most important time. <laughs> we can kiki all we want, but when you're black, you can't avoid the realities of this world. And I might never come down. It's way bigger than just fun and jokes. Black lives matter! Yeah. We used it to create change intentionally. The series director, Prentice Penny, has numerous credits as a writer and producer on scripted TV, including Girlfriends and Insecure. I asked 
why he wanted to make this documentary. Uh, insanity, probably. Uh, <laughs> um, I just finished Insecure, um, and I knew that whatever I did next would be kind of compared to that, so I kind of wanted to take a pause of like, what do I really want to do next? And I really wanted to chase being scared again. Um, and when this came across my desk, I initially said no, because I was like, I don't, <laughs> I don't do this. But then I thought about like Spike Lee, who's one of my favorite filmmakers, who obviously does narrative, but also had done Four Little Girls, and When the Levees Break, and the Michael Jackson doc about Off the Wall, and, I started to think, well, if I was going to do it, how would I want to do it? You know, and then that became exciting. So I got to say, if people haven't seen the film yet, this is it's so multi-layered. You could have taken an approach like, hey, let's dive in this world of pop culture. And that would have been fun. And you and that is a layer to this. But then there are all these other you know, uh, more profound layers about, you know, what this meant to a community. Uh, there's a there's a kind of cultural context here of the way throughout the history of entertainment, black people have uh, been underpaid for their labor while media moguls uh, made a lot of money uh, off of it. Um, we we get all of that uh, in, in this series. So when, once you took it on, how did you, you know, start building your team or thinking about what this was going to be? Yeah, the trickier thing was it was based on an article that was in Wired Magazine. The article, I came onto the doc in 2021, so pre-Elon or any of that. And for me, the biggest thing was, okay, how? what is the story here, though, right? Because if you can just Google all this stuff, then that's just like a fact, but it's not necessarily a story, right? So for me, it was, what is the story? Uh, because you could focus on so many different things. And as I kept reading the article, the article was written in three parts. And that was like, oh, that's like a narrative three-act structure kind of here. And as I kept reading the article, I kept, and I kept inter interviewing the, the, uh, the writer of the article, it felt like a coming of age story. It felt like there was this fun, time of Black Twitter where Black Twitter was just like having fun, no, just like what is this space? And then Trayvon happens and it takes the it takes the platform in a different, more mature direction. And so for me, that kind of reminded me of like Star Wars. I was like, oh, this is like, Luke doesn't know anything about the Force, he doesn't know anything about Jedis, and he's this sort of farm boy, and then he gets into this adventure, and then Obi-Wan dies. That's the first like step into a darker <laughs> direction. And obviously, Elon is the emperor. Uh, so, so, but so I was like, oh, that's a classic coming of age story, Harry Potter, stand by me. So then, so then it was, okay, now I understand I'm telling a coming of age story, right? Where things that were memes and, and fun in episode one, are, those memes and those hashtags are getting used in more uh, uh, activism uh, endeavors, right? So Thanksgiving clapback becomes Black Lives Matter, right? And things like that. So once I understood that, then it was putting together, you know, an, a really great showrunner and Joey Jacoby. And we were starting to use the people that were in the article as the basis to sort of build, build the story around. And then once we understood, oh, it's a coming of age story, what are the events that we can tether to this coming of age story? And then we sort of built around, well, let's talk to those people that were kind of involved in those events. Like an April rain. A hundred percent. Oscar so white. The amount of visual footage that you're using, you're, you're, you're digging up old tweets, you're digging up memes, um, GIFs, uh, and they are fired off at a rapid rate. Um, can you talk about the, the, you know, the, the undertaking it was to, to gather all that material? Yeah, it was, it was tricky. I mean, I think the, for us, it was, again, to that point, like, what is the visual style of the doc, right? So for me, I was like, okay, I want it to feel like you're in black Twitter. So I was like, if you were s sitting in front of the, s the screen watching this, you know, black Twitter is always having, like, interesting multi-layered conversations, right? So it was like, okay, well, sometimes we use GIFs and memes to, like, punctuate a point, right? We'll be super comedic or things will you know, come on the screen, you'll scroll, and then that'll lead you to something else, and you'll go into that, you know, kind of wormhole. So for us, it was how do we make that feel visually come alive, where you could start seeing an interview subject, you scroll, like, you scroll down, and you pick up somebody else's interview subject, right? So for us, it was let it feel like you are literally in the platform, and let it feel the way the conversations happen in the platform, right? And so for us, it was if it's a bunch of memes and GIFs to punctuate a point, 
let's just do that and people will understand what we're trying to say. So that was really, even the sets was a big thing of like, you know, for me, it was like, I, it felt like I didn't want to see just a doc where like people are kind of sitting in like a generic space. I was like, I wanted to feel like when you people curate their avatar, right, their picture. So we were like, we, we should put these people in these kind of deconstructed sets where like people engage on black Twitter. So it was like building, I think we built like 25 sets of like a subway set a park set, a barbershop set, a beauty salon set. And we were trying to, you know, April Rain is sitting in a movie theater set. So it really was about kind of curating each environment to be very specific in the way that we engage on the platform too. Uh, it's very deliberate uh, and very well done. And and I gotta say, there are so many laugh out, just seeing watching the film alone with myself, I was laughing out loud uh, uh, so many times. I also feel like for, the, the history of documentary filmmaking, people will go to archives, and usually going to archives means you're calling up like a set of videos, you're, you're going to a database and say, give me this, uh, you know, anything related to, you know, black people playing golf. Uh, and you're diving into an archive that doesn't exist in that kind of institutional way. I mean, finding all those, all these visual references that you talk about, um, I mean, can you elaborate? Like, you know, is it just people in a room saying, like, wait, there's a great Jefferson's meme. We got to get that one. Or yeah, no, it, it, it literally was people being like, what was that episode of Martin where Shadene does the thing? And it's like, let's go try to find that. I mean, literally, it was, we would spend hours and hours of, and being like having like eight gifts in a row and being like, but which one? is the one that's the right one for this. And we would line up those gifts and put them next to it, like, oh, that's the right one, right? And, and then it would be things like that. So that really did happen, where we would be sitting there curating gifts, which I don't know if that's a big thing in the doc space. <laughs> I want to understand how you think about this idea that you very much grapple with in, in the film of the way the black community enlivened Twitter, made it a super exciting place to be by contributing free labor to it that um, that turned it into you know a uh, huge IPO um, that no one who was doing that labor you know saw any benefit from well how like how do you hold these two things in your head that there's this you know kind of exploitative side to uh, social media but then there's also like a great community side to social media yeah, I mean, I think black culture and black life from the moment we were brought off the ships has always done that, right? So the slave trade is literally pe people profit, you know, profiting literally off of black people, right? So there's just that, that, that is, that fundamentally happens in this country a lot, right? Sometimes it might happen in music, sometimes it might happen in fashion. One of the things we talked about a lot was, you know, the early days of rap music was really building these record labels, but these artists weren't getting paid, right? Like, I think we were talking, we were like, man, it's so crazy that, like, you know, my kids don't know Will Smith or Queen Latifah or LL Cool J as rappers. They just know them as actors, right? Because they've made most of their money as actors, right? They were good rappers, but they weren't profiting in the same way that I think kids today, like rappers today, who I think, like, saw what how they sort of got used and when I think about like Travis Scott has a Nike collab or Saweetie has a McDonald's meal or Ice Spice has whatever she has and you're just like they're just so much smarter in terms of understanding how to monetize their brand that just didn't exist back then and the same on the platform right it just didn't exist because nobody really knew what this was it really was the wild west but when you see something like Zola happen that does become like oh that's a thing that like got built kind of organically on the platform that took off on the platform that then became a movie that then and I think you know somebody said that that Zola walked so Risa Tisa could run. And I was like, that's a great, <laughs> that's, a, that's a great metaphor because I think that's kind of the point, right? So it is unfortunate that someone like Kashawn Thompson doesn't financially benefit from you know, creating the phrase black, um, black girl magic, which happened on black Twitter, but she's benefited in so many other ways as, as, have, all, you know, as have all of us, right? So it might not be a monetary way that that thing has happened, but I mean, I think that the impact of that, I think, far exceeds anything else. Uh, the project has been out in the world for a couple months now, uh, I think. Um, what has been the reaction you've heard back? Uh, well, when we first were coming out, it was a lot of like, why do we need this? You know, uh, apprentices, the feds, uh, a lot of, I'm, I'm snitching on something that is t almost 20 years old, uh, which I thought was fun. Um, but I think now it's been like, oh, I didn't really know what this was gonna be. And it's so funny because like my wife has never been on social media like that. My kids are like TikTok kids, so they're not, they're not on the platform. 
but they just move in the world where like Black Lives Matter and Black Boy Joy and all these sort of hashtags just exist, but didn't know where they came from. And I just think it's interesting, which was, somebody said this, and this was really like a really profound thing for me, which was like so much of our culture is oral tradition anyway, right? Because we weren't either allowed to read or write or and we had to pass these things down kind of organically. Um, and the interesting thing about Twitter is all these things are documented and exist, but when Elon bought the platform, he could turn it off like today and all of what was happening on Black Twitter would be gone. So 75 years from now, Black Twitter would be just another oral tradition, which is wild to think about, right? And so for, for me, it was like, yes, these things have to be sort of told and documented. And it's not just, it's interesting, because it, I don't want to see it as like, oh, this is like a black story. This is like an American story, right? It's, it's touching on politics, it's touching on access, it's touching on tech, it's touching on so many things about this country that I just think like, you know, because again, black culture is always sort of having two or three or four conversations all at the same time, right? And so I just think it, that to me was such a important thing. So I think the response to that has been, I, I feel very positive. Uh, Jenna Wortham from the New York Times uh, is a prominent figure, uh, has a lot of smart things to say in the film. One of the things that the responsibility of social media co uh, companies to monitor what gets out there because we know there's a lot of lies and slander and worse that's perpetuated um, on social media. How, how did you come to think about uh, that? You know, the, 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 the arguments on social media between like a free speech absolutism uh, versus there should be some controls, but and how does that control take place? That's the crazy part of all of this, right? You know, one of the things we talk about in the in the doc, there's this uh, Amiri Baraka, who's a poet. He came up with this poem called "Technology and Ethos," and the core of the the core of the uh, piece is really about you know technology is imbued with the values of their creators, right? And so you can sort of see. So even though you know Elon doesn't didn't create the platform, he's in control of it, right? So it's now imbued with the values of him, right? And that becomes that's what becomes dangerous to me, right? Is like, again, who is deciding what the values are? What values matter to you? That's what you will allow on the, on the platform of that. And I think it's different than saying, you know, there's a town hall, I mean, it's a town square and it's freedom of speech. But, you know, what were the things that you couldn't say before on Twitter that, he, <laughs> that Elon feels, oh, well, now you really can say some stuff. And who's saying it? And to who? And to whose detriment, right? And so those are the things that I think become very dangerous that we're trying to point out in the doc. And one of the things that we sort of get to, and the point is that Elon is similar to a long line of people that do want to control the way Americans think. We talked about the way that Hearst did that with newspapers. We talked about the way that, that Murdoch did it with cable and Elon's another line of doing that digitally in terms of controlling how he wants Americans to think and the perception of that. And so I think we've seen the dangers of of inaccurate information in this country um, and seeing the real harm of that. I mean, there's real harm in that. Um, uh, and so that's what I think we're trying to get to in the doc. That was Prentice Penny talking about Black Twitter, A People's History, produced by Onyx Collective. You can watch the three-part series streaming on Hulu. Filmmaker Sam Lipman Stern spent two decades working on his series, Telemarketers. When he started, he was a teenager who went to work for a company called Civic Development Group, known as CDG. They ran an office making scam calls, claiming to represent groups like the police or firefighters to solicit donations. Sam started to film inside the office, capturing the quirky characters who worked there, including ex-convicts who couldn't get hired anywhere else. Eventually, Sam was motivated to expose the company's shady business. But he was just a teenager with a lot to learn about filmmaking. We hear him in the trailer. Get money, 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 money. We need to show the world what this place really does. The media and the government haven't been able to stop them, so now it's up to us. Sam struggled for years to get his project made. Finally, he teamed with his cousin, Adam Bala Lowe, who had more professional experience. The Safdie brothers came on as executive producers, and the series aired this spring from HBO Documentary Films on Max. The directors, Sam and Adam, joined me on stage. I asked Sam... What compelled him to start filming inside CDG in the first place? 
I mean, I was working, I, was, uh, I dropped out of high school when I was 14, and I, the only job I could get was working at this crazy telemarketing company. McDonald's and Burger King both turned me down, and my buddy's like, hey. There's a level below that. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, come, and, well, I'll, I'll get you a job at this call center. Um, and I walked in and just started working at this crazy place. They trained me to sound like a cop on the phone at 14. You do sound kind of sound like. Hey, that. how's it going? But yeah, so um, and you'd have like a murderer on your left and actual bank robbers who work actually robbing banks on your right, and we were calling for the cops. And I just thought it was really wild. First, I'm like, someone's got to write a book about this. This is so crazy, so ironic, and so interesting. And then when I met Pat, who's the co-star of and my, one of my closest friends, and he started saying, hey, there's something shady going on. There's, we're involved in a scam, where before I just thought, okay, well, this is how cops raise their money. Um, but once, once, we, once Pat started turning me on to the scam element, how we were involved in a very big scam, that's when we were like, okay, we have to, let's, let's try to do something about this. Let's try to make a documentary about it. Uh, maybe you can just illuminate very little of the money that you were raising was actually going to the police. Yeah, so the, the way that it worked was that 90% um, would go to the telemarketing company and 10% and would go to the cops. But we also would call for veterans, uh, firefighters, cancer organizations, and it, 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 the, peop the organizations we called from ran, um, ran the gambit from you know, the biggest police organization in the world to charities that turned out to be total scams that were shut down by the government because they were fake, fake charities. So, uh, and you and and Pat, who you uh, uh, mentioned, kind of carried this project along. You'd move it forward, maybe set it aside for a while, revive it over years and years. Um, what was it that was kind of keeping you going? I mean, I think what kept what kept me going was the fact that, you know, I, no one, I thought that it was such a, first of all, people would tell me, I'd say, oh, you know, I'm working at this company, and they say, oh, I've gotten that call. I got that call asking for a donation to the police, to the veterans, to the firefighters, to cancer. Um, and, but there was never any documentary about it. And, there, you know, sometimes there'd be a local news story on the 10 o'clock news, like, oh, scam police organization calling and, and you know, uh, middle of nowhere, Ohio, but no one ever did a documentary about it, and we just felt like people needed to know the story behind this, because everyone got the call for the police, for the donation, and no one knew that it was, had a very uh, sinister element underneath. So, Adam, a, a sub-theme in this film is uh, is Sam's like efforts to make this film and, you know, without film training or, or experience. Um, at some point, he connects with you, your cousins, am I, uh, am I right? Uh, because you had a little bit more professional uh, film experience. What did you make of the project when, when Sam reached out to you? I mean, at first, I didn't answer the call. <laughs> I was just like, it's, it's uh, you know, our, our, our families have been trying to get us together for years. And then finally, you know, I started working with Danny McBride and the Rough House guys and developing projects together. And I said, Sam, could you come in and you know, bring, us, bring us something? And he brought us this project and immediately I started sending clips of Pat uh, and, and Larry Lazar. That, that clip we just played, I start, started sending it to McBride and Dave Gordon Green and Jody Hill and, and we were all just like, this, these characters are amazing. Like it's, I mean, it's an incredible, an important story about corruption and but it's the characters that really was what made it special and what sold us uh we keep talking about pat sam can you explain who pat is for people who haven't seen the film so pat is a when i met him i was a, a 14 year old high school dropout uh felt like a total loser didn't feel like i had a future in life and i met pat a th uh guy in his mid-30s who was deep in heroin addiction, but very charismatic. Like, everybody in the office was drawn to Pat. He was just the sweetest guy, always there to help people. He just had a, a heart of gold, but he was struggling with heroin addiction. Um, and he was the one that was like, hey, we need to make, 
we need to expose what we're involved in to the world. Uh, but he, it, for him, it was really, you know, for him, it was being on the street. He, he was, he, you know, took a risk of being on the street and being homeless uh, to pursue this company and try to take it down with me and expose it. You know, there, there is something about the two of you guys trying to do this without resources. You eventually get the attention of, of politicians and, um, and, uh, and experienced journalists who, uh, are, you know, are fascinated by this um, rare footage that you have. I mean, the, a, a, there's a journalist that you, you talk to who's been covering this for a long time, but she's never seen footage like you have um, from inside this. But then it reaches a level where, okay, we're, we're, like we're gonna go sit down with a serious politician and you know, and you and Pat don't have experience doing this. And, and as a viewer, you're like, oh my gosh, like how is this going to uh, go? Um, uh, and and you're, there's humor in it. There's, um, you know, I think a degree of vulnerability for you to be sharing that uh, with us uh, as the audience. Can you talk about, you know, what your mindset was of, uh, you know, like maybe the ex-heroin addict shouldn't be doing this interview is what I'm thinking. Like maybe get the Wall Street Journal reporter to come in with you. Yeah, I mean, I think that for us, we wanted to tell the story as true as it was. And what it was was, you know, a, you know, a teenage high school dropout graffiti writer and a 35-year-old heroin addict trying to expose a multi- Million Maybe dollar Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, trying to expose a hundred million dollar plus scam by the biggest police organization in the world. As crazy as that is, and it is crazy. Like we didn't know what we were doing when we started, but we knew we wanted to expose it to the world. So we just kind of kept going. I think for us, it was really important to just let Pat be Pat. You know, Pat is Pat, and that's what that's what makes and all all the characters. We were really. It was really important for us to just let the people be themselves, you know, include and, and the, the good, the bad, the ugly, including myself and um, just humanize the different people, you know. So, Adam, it's one thing for this to be, uh, you know, a gonzo project that, you know, maybe you're going to put on YouTube. Uh, but when it gets into a more serious level, like we're going to put this, we're going to partner with HBO Documentary Films and uh, put this on Max. What were some of the like things you had to figure out about this you know, 20 year archive of footage that, you know, uh, covers a wide range of very questionable activity. Yeah, I mean, you know, this, at, at its heart, this is a very serious story about corruption and it goes way up to the top. So, you know, we had to do our homework. We had to fact check everything and, you know, really make sure that it was buttoned up because we were making claims and, you know, tying loose ends together that connected to, you know, the biggest police organization in the country. And so it was scary, but we, with the help of HBO, like, and, and our incredible lawyers, Lisa Califf, we were able to fact check this thing and, and, and um, you know, do our homework. But it was, it, was, it was really for, it was a lot of work. So Tam, Sam, talk to me about this serious side of this. I mean, what were you hoping to achieve, uh, and you know, and what is possible to make these calls stop in our homes? It's a, <laughs> it's a good question. I mean, so I think what we were, what we, you know, the original goal was to expose this scam to the world. So make a documentary that people can watch and they can understand how the scam works from the inside, from the outside. You can show it to your, your grandmother, your aunt, your father. You, you can learn how it works for the first time. So that was like our first goal. The second goal was to try to have some kind of congressional change, have, have change in Washington, because this, what we learned in episode three is that the scam is crazier, more money, than it's ever been. I mean, we're talking, AI is involved. We had, I want, not to give away spoilers, but it turned out one of our colleagues was calling from beyond the grave. They recorded his voice, and his AI voice is calling people as we speak right now. Hey, he was a great seller. He was, he was great. I mean, he was a great seller. But um, we were, 
able, and very, we're really proud of this, that we were able to speak to a senator, to Senator Richard Blumenthal, and after, a week after the, the series came out, he put out a press release uh, proposing change. Uh, he put out a letter to the FTC and the FEC, and uh, so we were, it was really cool, and we were very grateful that we were able to go from, you know, the call center, being on the phones, to actually m affecting some change, you know? I have to say, I watched uh, this series on United Airlines, so like to see this, you know, this kind of scrappy thing that you started out as a 14-year-old be, you know, so far out in the world. But Adam, you described that like one of the concerns is like putting this thing out in the world is uh, is also r risking pushback from some powerful forces. So what's it been like in the months since this has been out in the world? I mean, it's 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 actually been great. I've I've had cops come up to me and say that they appreciate the show. They find telemarketing fundraising to be distasteful. They always have. Um, so we've just, and, and I think a big part of it was, and, and how we were able to win over a lot of cops is because of the authenticity of it. And because we, it wasn't just me, like a third party documentary filmmaker coming in and making this. It was people who were involved in the scam. And, you know, so, Cops feel like, you know, we, to a certain extent, kept it real. And I think a lot of cops appreciate it. And, and actually, the craziest thing is that Sam and Pat have been asked to speak at the PBA, which is another police union, at their national conference in Nashville, Tennessee. When is that happening? We're, that's October uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. We're going to, they asked us to come out and speak. Because they don't, they haven't, they don't, they stopped using telemarketers. So they're like huge fans. The, pr the president of the PBA went on the radio talking about how much he loved the show, and um, yeah, so. A, lo a lot of um, local organizations have stopped using telemarketing since the show came out, because they realize it is just kind of wrong. But at the same time, it is, uh, a lot have stopped, but it's still, it's still going on, and I have, a, uh, I have a good friend that I worked with at CDG who's still on the phones, and he, he, every time he gets somebody saying, oh, I just saw the documentary, hang up, and hangs up, he sends me a text message about it. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so last question, Sam. You, you know, a lot of filmmakers in the audience, uh, all of us who have made films before have projects that we carry on for too long and wonder if it's ever gonna see the light of day. Um, uh, you made it, you made it across the finish line. Uh, you can give us uh, hope. What, how does that feel? Yeah, I mean, I, it feels it feels really good. I mean, I, I one of the, the the two things I really wanted to, I hope to achieve in, um, from finishing this was one, for everybody out there, for creatives, like finish that project, whether it's the book, the mo the the movie, uh, the idea, the whatever it is, the business. It might take twenty years, but just keep at it. And, and you know, eventually, just, just believe in yourself and just keep going. And the other thing was, you know, we were up against huge odds. I mean, again, it was, you know, Pat and I met at both very low points of our lives. And, uh, you know, we just kept pushing. And we, were, we went up against really powerful police organizations and also um, super wealthy, shady businessmen. And uh, one thing I'd like to just put out there is to inspire people like if the truth is if you want to you know you want to get the truth out there you know just just do it if you're a journalist like even if you're against huge odds let, let's just keep fighting for getting the truth out there bring sir citizen journalism back that was the directing team behind telemarketers sam lipman stern and adam bala low the series from hbo documentary films is streaming on max Now we turn to Our Planet 2, a continuation of the Esteem Nature series narrated by David Attenborough that's a co-production of the World Wildlife Fund, Silverback Films, and Netflix. I was joined by the composer for the series, Joshua Klebe. He's written music for a number of nature projects. I asked how he got into that groove. One of the first projects I did was Planet Earth 2 uh, back in what, 2016. 
and I just kind of went through a pitching process and uh, was squatted alongside uh, Jacob Shea and Hans Zimmer. And that kind of set me down a path of meeting a lot of scientists and directors of natural history over in the UK. And they kind of kept bringing me back. <laughs> And so what are those conversations uh, like? And, and, and when are you being brought into the process? We're being brought in usually about, I would say, a year in advance before it releases. And, uh, you know, a program like this, what was really exciting about it was because of the focus on migrations. And so there was already kind of a clear idea that this is the overall concept and how can we bring something fresh and new to a program. You know, there's, there's a lot of natural history programs that seem to come out now and I think we're all striving to bring something new to an audience and uh, so I think that's what this program does specifically really well. Um, and it's really fun to work on these programs because you are talking to scientists, so you're, you're, you're hearing about how they spent months in this little tent on this island to get these shots, and it really helps you place yourself in those settings and how you can create an atmosphere that reflects what we're seeing on the screen musically. Do you ever get to meet these people, or are you just totally isolated in your own composer. World. Oh yeah, no, we definitely, we, you make points to go over and you, you meet everyone, you have conversations. I mean, so much is obviously done on Zoom as well. Um, but it is incredible the amount of team involved in creating these programs, uh, just from all the cinematographers. And even on this program, because of the pandemic that was going on, they had to use a lot of local photographers for it, which was ended up being a huge advantage to them because they could go out and really capture some incredible things without actually having to go there simply because they had people that were so knowledgeable of that animal because of the location they live. So we have a clip about elephants that actually does use your music, unlike the uh, trailer music. Um, is there anything you want to say about the like the music that we're going to hear in this? Or? Yeah, I think, like I said, we really wanted to try to do something that felt visceral and fresh with this program. And so with this, uh, you're seeing this herd of elephants that are unfortunately being forced to migrate out of a forest um, because of climate change. And so they end up traveling into villages in a city. Um, and in order to kind of create that feeling and that motion, we started off with some different types of instrumentation. We wanted to use something very organic and woodsy, so we were doing low cellos, low basses, and also an organ. And an organ is essentially like this living, breathing instrument. It uses these bellows uh, to pump air, kind of like a lung, through essentially wooden tubes, which are, you know, could be looked at as kind of these hollow trees. And as they migrate and get it closer into a city, we then switch instrumentation to become more inorganic. We use a lot of metals. We used uh, the sound of car horns and manipulated those sounds. So um, we just, th this program also was, I think, one of the first ones to ever, within natural history, do cliffhangers. So you're going to, this scene's going to end um, of episode three, and then you'll kind of, the story continues in episode four. And it's, um, which was a way to also kind of make things feel very cohesive and connected across the show. The family headed north into a very different China from the one they had left behind. For eight months, they trekked through strange new lands, but couldn't find anywhere to settle. So their newest arrival was born on the move. That, for elephants, was highly unusual. His start to life would be very tiring. But the now 17-strong family had to keep traveling. So it was interesting to hear you say that, you know, like the car horns are a part of this. I think when we think about composing, we think about, you know, uh, you sing in front of a orchestra or maybe on a synthesizer, uh, but um, don't necessarily think about all this other kind of palette of sounds that you might uh, uh, work with. Can you talk about you know, the whole broad palette of sounds that you tried to work with? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so on this program, we used about 200 different musicians, 300 different instruments. 
um, 45 singers. And because I've had the privilege to work on so many of uh, natural history programs, I think every time I come into it, I'm wanting to just kind of push the dial a bit more of how can we approach these programs differently um, from a music standpoint. And so with this one, it really was about, because because the program was so much about movement, how do we create these like visceral reactions to the way an animal moves? Um, I was a competitive gymnast for 15 years, and I look at movement in a very specific way simply because I was trained my body to do so. And so I think that was really exciting to take something that just inherently is part of me at this point and look at the way these animals move. So there's a scene where these uh, cranes are flying up above the Himalayas, and um, there's this beautiful shots of the drone right next to them. And as they flapped, they create a natural rhythm. And that essentially dictated our uh, tempo for the piece of music. And from there, it was like, how do we create something visual that we can do uh, to, to translate that? So we took uh, palm fronds and actually flapped them to make whooshy noises. We took woodwinds and we, uh, as they ascended higher and higher, they'd become high, uh, the pitches would become less and less uh, and tighter in air breaths. Um, we used a lot of vocals. Vocals was a very key part of this project, and that stemmed from the fact that there was a scene early on that we saw. It's probably the most poignant scene, I feel like, in this series, where you see this uh, albatross on this beach uh, in this remote island called Laysan, and within that, um, the camera kind of pans over and you just see millions of pieces of plastic that have washed up. And unfortunately, these birds eat the plastic and die because, uh, and they're mistaking it for food. And I think that really told us that, you know, we need to have a vocal presence within this because even if we're not being seen on the screen, our presence is very much there. And I think that's just the reality of how these programs have kind of grown since early days in the sense that, you know, we, we take up a lot of space on this planet, but it is our responsibility to look after the planet for, for all involved. And so just trying to take these ideas and translate them into different musical instruments um, to, to, to achieve that is important. I'm trying to process uh, hundreds of musicians and hundreds of singers that you were able to work with. Uh, you know, for most filmmakers, uh, were like you know grabbing uh, free to use music uh, off the internet. So what a what a luxury that is. I mean, can you know, in your career composing things, do you, do you feel that as a luxury? Yes, absolutely. You know, you don't you don't always get. Uh, you know, the freedom and abilities to do that. But I think with this project, you know, it's a huge thanks to uh, the Silverback team and Netflix for giving us kind of this ability and freedom to explore and experiment um, with, you know, there, there was one incident where we brought in a, all these very classically trained uh, vocalists and we brought them into this beautiful church in London and we asked them to do everything but sound beautiful. We asked them to grunt, to scream, to growl. And this was over scenes of uh, the stampede of buffalo being hunted by lions. And I mean, they, they got very much into it. Um, and you kind of become, I guess, a casting director as a composer throughout this process. You're kind of casting these musicians to be the perfect role for these specific scenes. And that is always a journey to figure out what, what we can do and how we can uh, bring in different elements in that way. And it really is, you know, composing is just such a collaborative process in that. And this project in particular was extremely collaborative in that. I think with the Our Planet series, you know, when I watch it, I, it opens up lots of ideas about uh, nature and um, a man's role on this planet. And, you know, and I might spend a few hours with it uh, watching it, and I'll carry forward some of those ideas uh, later. But you're immersed in this um, for a much longer uh, uh, period. And, and I wonder, you know, how it affects you uh, uh, being immersed in this material. Yeah, I think I definitely look at the world differently having gone through these experiences on these projects. Um, I mean, I, I remember one moment when I was in the middle of working on this thing of this flock of birds, and I walked outside my studio, and we were using our dark little rooms, and there was a flock of birds going overhead, and I kind of paused and looked up, and it just made me think 
a little bit differently about how, you know, where are these birds going, how incredible it is that they're know to migrate the way they do, what it must be like to look down on a city instead of a forest or, you know, a, a meadow. And I think that's what we hope to do as being a part of these projects. Um, as, as a composer, I think we're just hoping that we help the audience connect a bit more emotionally to the images on the screen so that they take that into the real world and maybe just care a bit more about how we protect it. That was Joshua Klebe, the composer of the series Our Planet 2 that's streaming on Netflix. Now, our final title of this episode, the four-part Netflix series Beckham, about the English football star David Beckham. Even if you know nothing about his sports career, you probably know his name as a tabloid fixture, married to Victoria, a.k.a. Posh Spice. In this series, they open up about the stories behind the headlines. The director, Fisher Stevens, is a multi-hyphenate talent. You may know him as an actor, recently in succession. He's also the Oscar-winning documentary producer of The Cove. Fisher couldn't join us in Los Angeles, so I pre-taped an interview with him. I asked how much he knew about Beckham when he started. David Beckham was kind of... Uh... In my mind, a very beautiful looking ex-footballer who was amazing at branding uh, products and married to a uh, Spice Girl who um, was also very successful at branding. <laughs> and, but, so you had not really followed his career as a footballer through Manchester United, Real Madrid and uh, his, his other, all the story beats that we see in this film. No, actually, I discovered English football uh, the year that he left, where he was in uh, Madrid. And I, I started following it through a documentary called uh, Once in a Lifetime that I had produced with John Batsik. Batsik took me to some games in England. I got obsessed making this movie. David Beckham was in Madrid. I didn't really even follow Spanish football. And uh, no, I, I really was not a fan. I was not aware of actually how good he was even that because I didn't even really it, it didn't register you weren't following it so, so no. how did this project uh come to be so I was um I got a call out of the blue from uh Leonardo DiCaprio's office uh saying that uh, Leo had suggested me to direct the the series version of David Beckham's life they were friends David had been struggling to find someone would I call him his office I was like, well, that is the weirdest, most random uh, call I ever got. I um, was actually on my way to acting job on succession. I spoke football every day with my producers because they're English and we talk, we love football. I asked them what they thought of David Beckham. They said he was a legend. They said he was an incredible footballer. I said, really? How good was he? And then they said, you've got to do this movie because he's an important cultural figure of England and the world. And I was like, really? So that got me peaked. And then I actually did meet with David on a Zoom. It was during COVID. And he was much different than I expected. He wasn't kind of the kind of posy, pretty boy. He was very vulnerable, said he wanted to tell his story his way before somebody else did it. And um, we started a bit of a dance. It took a bit of time. And um, it wasn't until I actually met him and his wife for dinner and had FaceTime in England where it was like, oh, I think we have something here. Yeah, I mean, I watched this four hours with the same starting point uh, that you had, not knowing much about the career, knowing of David Beckham and Victoria Beckham as kind of tabloid uh, figures um, more than anything. And, and, and that revelation that you had, I think comes through uh, in the film. I mean, both David Beckham and Victoria Beckham in the do these long interviews uh, with you. To, uh, clearly, several interviews because there's different uh, changes of clothes and, and different uh, uh, positioning, yeah. and um, you interview them each separately, and it's and you have a lot of fun with their sometimes contradictory uh, viewpoints um, on things. But both of them describe their interviews near th in, in, in the fourth episode 
as having been like therapy uh, for them. I wonder if you can describe, you know, what it was like delving into some of the hardest parts of their life. Well, what was so interesting for me was David Beckham really did not like to look back and not genuflect and had never been to therapy, had never really, I mean, he he was a working class kid that is taught to just move forward, move forward, move forward. So when he asked me to do the film, I don't really think he quite understood that that meant he's going to have to like feel things and go into places that he's kind of pushed aside for years and shoved down. And especially a lot of English friends of mine, you know, they like to repress and I'm very American. I'm very like, let's just get it out there. Let's talk about it. Um, so I think David was kind of surprised at the emotion bubbling up from him. I mean, he broke down. He doesn't really, shed deep tears but he wells up and he can't speak and the number of times that he kind of i couldn't even include them because it would have been like indulgent and it would have been like it was too much but he found these emotions that he'd been sitting on and so much so that um i think he started to dread our interviews and part of the arrangement and agreement that i had with him was that i spend an enormous amount of time talking to him because I knew it was going to be difficult. And I really, in all of the short clips I watched of David, they were very surfacy. And I knew we had to go and go to a place deeper. So, um, and also after a three hour interview, he would be spent, he would be exhausted because he's not used to that. Um, and I think it was, uh, it was good for him and in a lot of ways, it was actually good for me because I'm like starting to go through my own shit, think about my own problems, <laughs> which, is part of the reason I probably do this as well. Um, and then Victoria was quite different because she was so excited to kind of have a sounding board and to kind of be able to express herself in a way that she has never been able to express herself. I think they made a deal. Well, actually, you can see it in the first episode where David breaks into the into the um, first interview unannounced and, and actually upset me quite a bit at the time, but turned out to be a great thing for the movie, but they made a deal to actually um, talk the truth and really open up in a way that they never did. And David clearly gave Victoria a from some permission to do that. And she just, you know, she had done therapy. She had tried to deal with her things. Um, and it was really interesting. Couldn't have been more different the two people in interviewing. You know, and um, I was grateful. I mean, it's so interesting to hear you say that because on screen, David does come across as forthcoming. I, I had the impression that he was someone who probably had done therapy and, and had dealt with these things just because he seemed to be present for, for your questions. He, yeah, well, he was forthcoming, um, but at times I found it very much like it took a while. You're yeah. seeing, you know, I mean, I interviewed him almost 40, 38 hours or something. So you're only seeing glimpses, but he, um, I do think in the end, he really did enjoy it. I think he did enjoy it. And um, I, I, I think in the end, it was good for him and it was good for their marriage. And originally, I didn't know the extent of the love story that, that the love story would be such a huge part of the film, but that was something that we discovered as we were interviewing both of them and just how he spoke about her, how she spoke about him, the, the relationship and how much they needed each other and how important they were to each other to get through this crazy roller coaster of a life that they, um, they are still sort of going on. And although right now it seems to be a, a very good ride, but um, they, uh, so the love story wasn't an original, like, oh, we're gonna make a love story, no. It was a love story originally about parents, families, team, Alex Ferguson. Um, but the Victoria love story just started to take over once we started doing the interviews, especially with her. We're like, oh, my God, this is incredible. So what were some of the most tricky areas to explore? I mean, there are a lot of story beats in this film. Sometimes when we watch series these days, they feel a little padded there's no padding uh, in these four hours. Uh, it is, um, you know, it's the kind of thing that uh, you couldn't really uh, script. Um, there, there are so many twists and turns and 
you know, extraordinary sports moments and extraordinary human moments and people put under pressure and, uh, and, and coming back from uh, real lows. Um, uh, so of all those things, like what was the hardest one to crack? Well, I think there were three really touch, three kind of touch points. The, the first big touch point was his relationship with Sir Alex Ferguson, um, which he, I, I can't tell you. The who, was co who was coach on Manchester United, yeah, who really right. found him as a young boy and protected him early in his career and mentored, was his chief mentor in his life next to his father. Yes. Um, and, and that, um, to this, I can't tell you the amount of times in the interviews, he said, I never wanted to leave Manchester United. I never wanted to leave Manchester United. He, he, he said it in pretty much every interview. It, it, it was a wound that was still open. Um, and I think that was a very difficult, uh, subject for David to get into. He's very emotional. Um, I didn't have to push him. But I think he was he feared it and and he knew this was going to be really tough. Even now, he says that it's very difficult for him to watch that part of the series. Mm -hmm. um, the other the other difficulty was obviously there was this whole uh, tabloid story in Madrid and the extramarital action that supposedly happened. I, I told him quite clearly that we're going to discuss this because we have to. It was a big part of your life. And he said, oh, yes, we can get into it. I, I think that was quite difficult for him to 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 touch on. Um, and he did. And, you know, it's a it's a quite squirmy moment in the film. But he did. You know, he was very open and willing to talk about it in his way. Um, the third part, you know, yeah. And the third part was his family and the amount of scrutiny on his children. And there were a lot of shots of his children being exploited by the paparazzi. And I think that was a really difficult thing for David and, and Victoria to deal with and to talk about as well, like the effect that that had on his on their children. So those were the three places, I think. But I, to their credit, you know, both Victoria and David were very open about all of these things. And there was, you know, this feud, this Sir Alec Ferguson sort of saying that David took his eye off the ball because of his marriage and his fame overtook. And there was this kind of Victoria was a problem vibe back, you know, back then that papers did. And they were all very willing to, to speak about that. Even Sir Alec, to his credit, was incredibly open to talking about it. Well, I want to ask you about some of the other interviews in the film, including the uh, Sir Alec's one, because the... <clears throat> You, you set it up when uh, he's arriving for the interview and you can kind of hear a an anticipation in your voice. We see you uh, in the room or we hear you behind the camera saying like, is that him? Is that him? Uh, so, uh, so I very much got a sense of your um, expectation for uh, for this for this meeting. Uh, you're talking to lots of different people, former coaches, opponents, people who... David Beckham has had clashes with, sometimes made up with, sometimes maybe it's still something uh, raw there. Who were the most tricky interviews to to, to get and do? Well, Sir Alec, for sure. Uh, David was very nervous about that one. They At that point, they, they were friendly, but they hadn't really speak, spoken more than one or two times since back, believe it or not. Um, I, I had so many things I wanted to talk to Sir Alex about. And they gave me 30 minutes and I was terrified and I was nervous. He's a legend. He's like a God, you know. Um, fortunately, he had seen Succession and knew me from Succession and gave me a, like 15 more minutes and knew Brian Cox. And we. He, I was so grateful. And it kind of broke the ice because he's like, Hugo, you know, and I'm like, yeah. And, and so that was good. But I was nervous. I wore a suit and tie. I got all dressed up, did my hair, you know. Um, I would say Simeone was another one who was the guy that David got the red card for kicking. Um, another legend of mine, like he's a he's a guy that I knew very well, followed in the World Cup, and um, yeah, he was incredible, very very much like a movie star, and admitted for the first time basically that he did a Hollywood fall, you know, which we got out of him, which was really great. Um, Senor Perez 
um, who runs Real Madrid, the president, El Presidente. I mean, we do a little take. I really was nervous for him. I was told to wear a suit and tie for that. I was told it's a very formal interview. He was the he wanted to be interviewed right there in front of the trophies. It was the only interview where I couldn't put the cameras anywhere I wanted. Um, but he was wonderful and nice. I, I mean, everybody was so cool, you know, to meet Ronaldo number nine, the Brazilian Ronaldo. I mean, World Cup legend, you know, it, it was it was a wonderful job. Um, but I have to say, I was a bit nervous for some of these guys, you know, more nervous than I would be if I interviewed, you know, any movie star, because for me, they're like my my movie stars, you know. You mentioned earlier that like as you were working through the emotional layers of of this story, you were, you know, thinking about your own stuff. And I wonder what were the, you know, emotional hooks where where where, where you were, you know, reflecting back on something of your of, of your own life. Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, obviously, my life is, you know, it's it's this much public, right? David is everything is public. I mean, I had a, you know, I had my own little foray into tabloids when I was 25, 26 years old with an actress where they were, you know, and it just brought back all these memories of my, my own crap. And I, I, I related, I related to him. I think part of the reason I love making documentaries is that because I'm an actor, really first and foremost, I try every interview to put my head into them, into like, if I was playing this character, what, what would I want to know? What would be my questions? Who, what would I want out of them? And, and I, I kind of get into whoever I'm interviewing is life, life. And there's a, sort of an acting approach that I take to when I do interviews and I put on a different kind of face depending on who I'm interviewing as well because I'm trying to get certain answers from them and like in acting when you're doing a scene with another actor you're trying to get things out of that other actor so I'm a, a way it's 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 kind of interesting and it's another reason I love doing this um except that I don't have to worry about what I look like because I I just have to worry about what what they look like or what you look like you know um but yeah, it brings up things, you know, being married for so long and having children and being a father, being a parent. It just, you know, it it, it brought up a lot of uh, a lot of stuff. And um, I think hopefully it was helpful in the process of making this show. That was Fisher Stevens talking about his series Beckham streaming on Netflix. I want to thank all of our guests and the partners who made this event possible, HBO Documentary Films, Onyx Collective, and Netflix. Stay tuned, because there's more to come from this Los Angeles event, hosted by The Ankler and Pure Nonfiction. On our next episode, we talk to the makers of five feature documentaries that are up for Emmy consideration. Those films are Sperm World, Jim Henson, Idea Man, The Greatest Night in Pop, and Restless Dreams, The Music of Paul Simon, and Stormy, about Stormy Daniels. Subscribe to Pure Nonfiction on Apple, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. We recently launched a newsletter called Doc Voices, written by Anisha Javeri. You can subscribe to that on Substack. Thanks to our team, series producer Hannah Nordenswan, partnership manager Bella Racklin, and web designer Cross Strategy. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams, and our executive producer is Raphael Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. Follow us on Instagram and visit our website at purenonfiction.net. <laughs>